Okay, guys, so let's go ahead and finish. This is part two of chapter 27. Um, so I'm going to continue with the um, HIV or AIDS patients and their dietary needs. These patients often have severe diarrhea. They will have also profound weight loss and muscle wasting. Their therapy is aimed to replace the fluids and electrolytes to assist them in weight gain, to replace um, lost muscle mass, and to maintain their immune system. Please make sure that you review Table 27-3 for the uh, diet therapy for um, specific diseases. Please make a note of this. Uh, one of the side effects of HIV or AIDS is that they will have ulcers in their mouth. So what we do is we give them fortified milkshakes to help them get good nutrition, okay? And we give them fortified milkshakes because they have ulcers in their mouth. Okay, now let's go to patients who have gastric, uh, nasogastric uh, tubes and uh, internal tubes. The reasons for the use of these tubes um, sometimes is for dysphagia, uh, following a stroke, infl uh, inflammatory bowel disease, decompression of the stomach before or after a surgery, obtaining gastric specimens for analysis, gastric feedings or lavage, we call those lavage feedings as well, and administration of medication, um, insertion and care. Please view skill 27-2 for that. So I want you to know that patients may not be able to tolerate oral fluid intake after a surgery or an acute illness, or if they have aspiration problems. Nurses can change the cons um, consistency of the food on the diet order. There are four different texture levels. I showed you parade today, um, earlier. So we have what we call parade, uh, pureed, and that is like pudding texture. And then we have mechanical soft. Mechanical soft is moist and minced. It looks like minced meat. Um, then we have mechanical altered, and that is moist and bite-sized. And then we have regular, of course. Please make sure you know all the different textures. Um, now, NG tube, that is usually placed as a temporary measure. So when you see a person with an NG tube, which we will teach you guys, uh, that is a temporary measure. That is not for the long term. When we insert a nasogastric tube, please highlight this. The patient is positioned with the head of the bed being 30 to 90 degrees with the bed at a working height for you to insert the nasogastric tube. So the head of the bed must be between 30 and 90 degrees. We check the airflow and the patency of each nair. We give the patient a emesis basin and then we agree on a hand signal and we normally say something to them like, if you notice that you're having pain or you need me to stop for a minute, uh, please raise the hand that's farthest away from me. We measure the distance of the tip of the nose to the ear, okay? And then from there to the xiphoid process. We mark that length with a piece of tape and those are known um, as the landmarks. So you must know the landmarks are from the tip of the nose to the ear, then from the tip of the ear to the xiphoid process, 
and then that is where we put the tape to signal our length. We lubricate the tube, which is at the very tip, with water-soluble jelly. Then we hyperextend the patient's head and exert, uh, exert it through the nostril, uh, whichever one they choose that has the best airflow. If resistance is met while we're inserting it, then we will use the other nostril. As the tube reaches the back of the throat, we have the patient to sip on their water, um, and then we drop their head forward to begin the swallowing. So we start with the hyperextended first, then we start threading. We shine a light, see it in the back of the throat, then we put their head down and have them to sip on the water. This helps them to swallow the tube better. We check position of the tube as it's passing down the back of the throat, like I just explained to you, by opening their mouth, looking in their mouth with your um, pen light. Please make a note of this portion right here. If the patient starts to cough, you must stop and assess the patient, okay? If the coughing continues, you have to remove the tube. Please highlight that. If the patient starts to cough, you must stop and assess the patient, okay? If the coughing continues, then you must take out the tube. If the, if the patient becomes short of breath or SOB or cyanotic, that's bluing, you must pull the tube out. Checking for placement. The tube placement should be checked every shift and prior to any feedings or administration of any medications. The way we can check this is by checking gastric pH. Um, it should be between one and four. That's how you know you're in the right place. If it's above six, it indicates that the tube is in the lungs or the intestine, neither of which we want. Some therapeutic communication that I want you guys to highlight and make a note of. When the patient asks why he or she may need this tube, you can say, tell me what your doctor told you about this. That is a good form of therapeutic communication. And just so that you can see what their understanding is and where they are on their knowledge as far as the tube. Now let's talk about irrigation of the tube. Often, it has to irrigate uh, to verify that, the pa that it's patent, okay? To keep them from clogging, we irrigate it. And it must have a physician's order in order to do so. The patient may complain of nausea or they may vomit. This may be a sign that the tube is blocked. So if you have a patient who is experiencing extreme nausea, or start vomiting after they've already had it in and everything. This may be a sign of blockage of the tube. Physicians will order frequency, type of solution, and amount that you are supposed to irrigate with. Normal saline is normally used, and we normally use at least 30 mLs or milliliters. Make sure that you disconnect from suctioning before irrigating. When irrigation is complete, reconnect to the suctioning mechanism. Record amount of irrigant uh, on your intake record. Always check the order for types, amount, and frequency of the feeding. Assess the abdomen for distension and tenderness often each time you're going to uh, put anything through their tube. Elevate the head of the bed 30 degrees to maintain, um, oh yes, and maintain the height of that elevation for 30 to 60 minutes after feeding and that prevents aspiration and it promotes stomach emptying. So after we um, feed the patient through their tube, we must maintain the head of the bed at 30 degrees for 30 to 60 minutes after the feedings.
to prevent aspiration and this promotes stomach emptying as well. Check the placement of the tube by attaching the syringe and aspirating some of the stomach contents. If you notice that there is more than 150 milliliters of residual formula obtained, hold the feeding and call the doctor. This indicates that the feeding was not well tolerated. So residual basically means what's still in the stomach, what did not empty out. Also check the placement by pushing 30 uh, milliliters of air into the tube and listen with your stethoscope for a swooshing. The best thing to do is to do this prior to checking for residual. And we also do that prior to removal. Infuse the air. Irrigation and food, let's talk about that a little bit. When we are administering um, medications through the tube, we have to be very, very conscious of the amount of fluid we're putting in with that as well. Now, when you are administering the tube feeding, we allow about 10 minutes for intermittent feeding to flow into the tube. Please write that. When administering of tube feeding, we allow 10 minutes for intermittent feeding to flow into the tube. Please make sure that you understand how we check the placement and the removal of the tube. That is noted on the review steps of NG tube on 27-1. Please make note of this. This is something that is a critical thinking area. What do you think that you would do if your patient starts to complain of nausea after you start the tube feeding? What do you think you would do? Let's use critical thinking. We would immediately stop the feeding and then call the doctor. Okay, we would immediately stop the feeding because clearly uh, that's what's giving them the nausea and call the doctor. Now let's talk about removing the tube just for a bit. Please make sure that you always explain the procedure to the patient prior to you doing anything. Please make sure that you understand and you know that you always explain the procedure to the patient prior to doing anything. When we are removing the tube, you must first make sure that you have an order to do so. Then you're gonna assess the amount, the color, and the drainage in the canister where the fluids were going up um, when you were doing the um, continuous or intermittent suctioning. You're gonna explain it to the patient, explain the procedure before you do it. Then you're gonna elevate the head of the bed about 30 degrees then you're going to turn off the suctioning or turn off the tube feeding pump, whichever one is on, prior to removing the tube. You're going to then place a towel over the patient's uh, chest and then you're going to put a basin there on their chest as well. And then withdraw the tube. And then when you do that, you can put that basin, that um tube that you're withdrawing you could double glove it okay some people will lay it in the tube to, to then get the patient cleaned up and then discard the whole thing you would want to pinch the tube and pull it out gently but you want to pull it out at a good steady pace you don't want to slowly pull it out because that's very uh, irritating to the patient after you're done removing the tube you want to offer mouth care for them and then you want to measure and record any gastric drainage and dispose the tube in the biohazard that is also on skill like i said 27-2 now there are different types of feeding tubes we have the plastic nasal gastric tube we have the small bore silicone feeding tubes and then we have the 
peg tubes, okay? And those are the percutaneous endoscop endoscopic uh, gastronomy tubes. We call those peg tubes, peg, P-E-G. So now let's talk a few, a little bit about these different tubes. So with the nasogastric tube, this can be used for lavage feedings, for tube feedings, and for administering medications. There's another tube that's called a, um, a Levine tube. And this is a long plastic tube that has holes, which we also call vents at the bottom. Then we have those Salem sump tubes um, that you guys had in your bags. And these are long plastic tubes with pigtail vents. And it's usually blue. And the pigtail has to stay open and is never used for irrigation or for feeding. So we tell, okay, so like when you guys are first looking at those Salem sump tubings, and you guys always want to stick something in that blue port, you're not supposed to um, stick anything in that. It's That is never used for irrigating or feeding, okay? Then we have the small bore silicone feeding tubes. And these are used uh, usually only for feeding tubes. And they're soft, they're flexible, and um, they are inserted with a guide wire or a stylet. And this requires a skilled person to insert this. Now the PEG tubes, uh, percutaneous endoscopic, gastronomy tubes. These are used for tube feedings and administering of medications. It is inserted during a endo end, um, endoscopy um, through the stomach and it's secured in place with sutures until it heals. The care of the PEG tubes are very similar to the care of an NG tube. The length of the tube should be measured from the skin level to the placement of the uh, adapter. And a measured, uh, the measurement should be checked daily for these uh, uh, peg tubes. And any dis discrepancies should be reported to the physician. That's for all tubes, okay? We must always check the measurements. Tube placement is checked at least every shift and prior to feeding or administering of any meds. Make sure that you know that. We always assess for skin breakdown around any tube placement areas. And we keep the tubes clean with soap and water at the insertion site. You can use saline or half-strength peroxide to remove, to remove any... Um, 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 escudate. Always document any of your uh, signs or findings around any of your tubes, period. Make sure, like I said, if there is measurement changes that you let the physician know ASAP. And we always observe the patient for pain, distension, and nausea. Um, and I want you to make sure that you write this down, highlight it, draw hearts, Draw stars because you're going to see this question a million times. You must check for residual prior, so that means before, feeding. If it is greater, if that means more than 150 milliliters, you must replace those fluids and delay the feeding for about one to two hours. You're not going to just throw that residual away. You put it back into their stomach and you will delay the feeding that you are going to try to start for at least one to two hours. If there is no residual noted, then you may administer the scheduled feeding. Okay? Make sure you know that. The amount of feeding is usually about 8 to 12 ounces. It may start with a smaller amount at first to assess the patient's tolerance. And the feeding should never be pushed uh, in 
as a bolus or in large amounts. Formula should be given per gravity. It is done by gravity flow. So that means that that plunger that is in your syringe, you never put the feeding or the formula in the syringe and then put the plunger back in. You will not ever do that. You will put the feeding into the syringe if you are doing it like that per gravity and you will hold it up and allow for gravity to work that feeding down the tube and into the stomach, okay? There's a few pictures there for you to kind of demonstrate where what those feeding uh, tubes look like and where they're placed. Please make a note of this. The tube should be taped so it is higher than the entry point of the body. So the tube must be placed um, and secured or taped so that it is higher than the entry level, you know, for gravity purposes. Another thing I need you to make sure that you understand and know, um, here it is, another critical thinking question. So, what do you think the best way is to tell if someone is not tolerating the feeding? Okay? Would it be the patency? Would it be a good flow? Would it be nausea and vomiting? Or would it be abdominal distension? What do you think? And what would you do? So, what would you, what would you teach the patient to let you know if they are experiencing? You will tell your patient, let me know if you're experiencing any uh, nausea after your feeding. Please use your call light and let me know if you vomit after your feeding. And then we're going to always continue to check for abdominal distension. If they are not tolerating the feeding well, it will most likely not have a good flow. Now let's talk about these feeding pumps. They kind of look like IV pumps. They can be continuous or they could be intermittent. Intermittent feedings are more uh, resemble normal feeding habits. Um, and the amount and the rate are prescribed by the physician. It may be necessary to start with smaller amounts and then gradually increase. If a syringe is used, the feeding should flow by gravity like we just described and not pushed or bolused. After the fluids have been given, we will flush the tube with about 30 mLs or milliliters of water after each feeding. We must flush and clear the tube after each feeding. Please make sure that you know these two key points. Well, it's really three. If you're doing gravity, an intermittent tube feeding should take about 10 minutes for it to flow in by gravity. And you may have to hold that syringe up a little bit. Here's the second point that I need you to know that I'm reviewing with you. Make sure that after the tube feeding, after the tube feeding, the patient needs to remain sitting up for 30 to 60 minutes. And you know the reason why. It helps for stomach emptying and it helps decrease the risk of aspiration. Okay? Another key point that we need to review. During a feeding, if a patient develops nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, you are to immediately what? Stop and call the physician. And the last key pump. A key point that I want to make within this area is another indication of a patient not tolerating their feeding would be abdominal distension, which is why we check for abdominal distension. Now, let's talk about the nursing process when it comes to these tube feedings. There are some steps for caring for patients with NG or intestinal tubes. We always will assess for the reason for the tube. 
the tube's effectiveness, the patient's understanding of the procedure. Make note of this. The function we will also assess of the tube every four hours for redness and swelling, okay, around the tube ports. We will continue to assess for signs of complication such as abdominal distension, abdominal pain, and respiratory distress. Some possible nursing diagnoses for patients who have tubes for feedings are the patient can have a risk for deficit in fluid volume related to nausea or related to vomiting. They could also have a nursing diagnosis for impaired nutrition that is less than body required. They could have a nursing diagnosis of risk for aspiration of stomach contents or difficulty swallowing. Now, let's talk about the total um, peritoneal uh, nutrition. I'm so sorry, guys. We call that TPN. Now, delivering TPN is normally done through a catheter into a large vein. This is used for patients on a long-term therapy for conditions such as uh, things like burns, uh, intestinal obstructions, inflama uh, inflammatory bowel disease, some patients who have cancers, some patients who have HIV or AIDS, more likely on the AIDS side, and the nursing process that we deal with when we're talking about TPN. Uh, we must also, always and also do the assessment, planning, implementation, and evaluation. Okay. The TPN is started slowly to allow the body to adjust to a solution that is high in glucose and concentration and hyper uh, osmolarity. We increase the concentrations of the solutes in the fluid. Make sure that you understand and know that. It is, TPN is started very slowly to help the body to adjust to the solutions, high glucose concentration and hyperosmolarity. Because this is increased concentrations of solutes in the fluid. You can also note that on table 27-4. Now you should monitor the flow of rate of the TPN every four hours. Make sure you know that. And also make sure that you know what you are to do if you notice a discrepancy of volume infused. If you notice a discrepancy for volume infused, you are always to document and then tell the charge nurse. Document and then tell the charge nurse. And then you get to document that you told the charge nurse. Now, a lot of TPN are given to patients per, like we said, the large vein, and that's normally like a central line placement, okay? There's a picture in your um, slides that show you what a central line placement, where it travels, where it goes. So, <clears throat> please think critical thinking once more. What would you expect to see if the patient developed fluid volume overload during fluid administration? Here's what you would expect to see. Rapid pulse, coughing, respiratory distress, crackles when you're um, oscillating their lungs, and you would also notice an imbalance of their intake versus their output. Document, document, document. For patients who have intestinal tubes, 
You must document those INOs like nobody's business. You must know what is going in, what is coming out. Where is this fluid at? You must document the size of the tube, the insertion um, amount, the insertion like um, length, and how the patient tolerated the procedure. You will also document the amount of tube feeding given and the result of the uh, feeding. Uh, you will document if you checked um, and how much you got from residual and what you did about it. You will document how the placement of the tube was checked. Was it checked by air? Was it checked by um, the pH strips? Was it checked by x-ray? You will also document the presence uh, or the absence of bowel sounds each and every shift. You will document any problems with nausea, constipation, or diarrhea. And then you're going to document the date and time of insertion and the date and time of tube removal. Now, that's the end of that. So I'm going to do here a few little end notes that I want you guys to remember to highlight and study very well. Um, what are some signs and symptoms of respiratory distress if you've given your patient something and then they start demonstrating signs of respiratory distress? What are signs of respiratory distress? They may have alterations in sensation. They may have um, the use of their accessory um, muscles when they're breathing. You know, you could just see their accessory muscles working as well. And they could uh, complain of effect uh, excessive dryness now here's another thing i want you to take away from all of these chapters which vitamin poses the greatest risk if taken in excess now if i gave you the options of thiamine now i know you guys are like oh thiamine thiamine i know what that is thiamine is when the Patients who are maybe alcoholics, they have a um, very, very low thiamine level. They have decreased thiamine. That is true. Um, but are we looking for thiamine to be in excess? Are we looking for the riboflavin to be in excess? Um, that could lead to a great risk. Are we looking for vitamin C? If that's in excess, could lead to a great risk. Or vitamin D the answer is vitamin D because vitamin D is fat soluble remember we were talking about that vitamin D is fat soluble so it will stay in the system longer and it can show toxic levels now another takeaway another review question if the patient recently started um, tube feedings um, and they have a complaint of nausea and having diarrhea what would you do would you check for tube placement would you slow the feeding down and continue to monitor the patient or would you stop the feeding and call the physician immediately you will stop the feeding and call the physician immediately. Now, here is a, another review question. If you have the patient's consent uh, form for an invasive procedure, it has to be transcribed um, correctly. If it was done incorrectly, what are the best actions if you wrote it incorrectly would you draw a line out and the, of the incorrect information and write error above that line or would you destroy the incorrect form and write a new one correctly what would you do now, people can see this answer either way. 
okay? Now, if you draw a line through it, you can't scribble. Remember that? You can't scribble through it. And then you would just draw that little line and put error in your initials. But if you notice a problem prior to doing anything, you just now got the consensus out and you're writing it and you made an error before they signed it, before you, you know, anybody, you know, when you first noticed the error, then uh, you can do a new one because no one has signed it. Okay. Here's another review question. TPN. It's a question about TPN. The nurse knows that the patient is receiving fluids with hyperosmolarity. So, what are they thinking? Are they thinking that the patient is going to be hypoglycemic? Um, no. Those fluids have increased glucose in them. Are we going to put a TPN through a uh, antecubital vein? No. We normally put those in the large vein, and it is done by a, um, you know, the central vein here. What did I tell you? Because it wasn't the pick line that we talked about. We talked about just central line placement. And the last review question is dealing with death. When dealing with death, all people deal with death in its due time. They all deal with death very differently. How you dealt with your personal feelings about death is how you will deal when you have to um, come face to face with the death of a patient and their family. Those are the end of my review questions for you. The end. Bye.